Where to begin with Mr. Bailatar? I chose 2007's The Man from London because I felt like it. Tar's directorial follow-up to 2000's work Meister Harmonies, the much-anticipated The Man from London, remains a slightly blackened sheep amongst Tar's oeuvre, at least judging by the general love gifted to 2011's The Turin Horse. I don't mean to bring up this film's reputation as a how dare they for neglecting it amongst Tar's catalogue, but more because I use this framework to potentially learn more about the film, siphon what its critics felt disappointed by in order to develop my own view of the film. It only seemed fair. I haven't given Bela Tar an introduction. I could waffle on about how Tar needs no introduction, but for the uninitiated, he kind of does. Bailatar's reputation is based around the challenging, monumentally pessimistic 1994 film Satan Tango, as infamous as it is acclaimed. Satan Tango is that seven hour long Hungarian film which those people brag about seeing and loving. I happen to be a fan of it and Tar's work in general. He's a fascinating exponent of the slow cinema pantheon. The sharp black and white photography of his better works offers a transparency into the weakness of the human soul. Communities and societies are fickle, fragile, trembling at the capacity of human wickedness. He tends to employ, in his later work certainly, extensive long takes with many shots, if not a majority, lasting at least six minutes. He is a careful choreographer, master of light and dark, a suction for the soul, as hidden behind human eye. I am particularly enamoured of the technical prowess of Tar's cinema more than anything else. There are those who choose Tar as the finest exponent of continental philosophy in cinema, or even just social commentary outright in cinema today, or even cinema forever. And that's all well and good. I mean, I love European films of the philosophic bend, but I hardly feel they have a monopoly on them, at least compared to, say, the cinema of Asia. Nevertheless, there's a kind of ideological scorn for optimism in Tar's work, which appeals to the many freaks and outcasts who are drawn, at least sometimes, to esoteric art, or at least then those who are overly vocal about consuming and appreciating it. The point I'm trying to communicate is the appeal of Bailatar in general, the unique emphasis on Bailatar in general, that is to say, why Tar and not Bartas, Feher, Sokhorov, or Kellerman, and then where I come into this universe. Which is rather happily, oxymoronically enough. For a Bailatar fan, I mean. Having just explained why I, and other types, enjoy consuming Bailatar's filmography, it is probably easy now to surmise why others do not. It has been accused of, paraphrasing years of forum and message board consumption, indulgence, philosophical amateurism, pretentiousness, being boredom-inducing, and whatever variant of Emperor's New Clothes you prefer. I imagine half of the distaste toward Bailatar is inspired by the seeming smugness of those who profess adoration. I don't condemn this, but I would implore those to keep an open mind. Judging art, or anything, by the behaviour of loud adherence is ill-informed and, frankly, juvenile. It's the same as liking something mainstream, but subsequently then hesitating upon noticing a wave of positivity amongst the dreaded masses. I mean, most people use art as mere social signalling. I cannot stop them, and art appreciation will suffer eternally for it. Oh well, woe, alas. Now onto the specific details for The Man from London. After 2000's Werkmeister Harmonies, Bailatar and his collaborator Laszlo Krez Nahokai had a desire to f adapt the 1934 French novel Le Homme de Londres by Belgian writer Georges Simenon. Returning with co director credit is the film's editor, Agnes Hranitsky, Tar's spouse, who was previously credited as co director on Harmonies, and then subsequently as well for The Turin Horse. The film was a co production between France, Germany, and Hungary and, uh, well, it served a highly troublesome production. The film's French, French producer, Humbert Balsan, committed suicide in February of 2005, days before shooting was due to commence. As the original financing of the film had, had then collapsed, the remaining producers managed to secure funding that allowed them to shoot nine days of footage on the expensive Corsican sets, until they were shut down through legal action by a local subcontractor. After many expressions of support from European film organisations and production companies, and even government bodies, a new co-production contract was finally signed in July 2005, containing a revised budget and shooting schedule. Apparently, unexpectedly, all rights to this film production were suddenly ceded to a French bank, based upon some justification found in the original production agreement. And then only after further changes in the film's backers was a deal finally struck with this bank, allowing shooting to resume in March 2006, 
well over a year later than had been originally envisaged. And so, this film's plot follows Malign, a middle-aged railway worker, of a pointsman to be specific, who witnesses a murder whilst on his job. After his, his secret act of witness, he recovers a briefcase containing a large sum of money from the scene of the crime. Racked by fear, by guilt, Malloy descends into despair and defeat, which leads to animosity amongst his family unit. To make matters more stressful and unpleasant, an English police detective arrives to investigate the disappearance of the money, interrogating several characters connected to the crime. Now, I could describe this film's plot further, though I'd be concerned of granting an image of... an undue image of conventional, conventionality... Uh, toward the plot's actual telling, which is highly considered specific and existentially charged, and I don't want anyone to have the image of something Hitchcockian derivative, a cheap, digestible means of illustrating human duress and capacity. Uh, for instance, those 90s English language, oh no, consequences romps like Shallow Grave or A Simple Plan. This picture is much, much more substantial, travelling with ferocious existential angst, which traps its already woeful protagonist in a maze of terror, shame, and fierce unpredictability. It has been written that the critical reception to The Man from London was generally quite positive, though apparently less adamant than that of the director's previous two works, Satan Tango and Workmeister Harmonies. While reviewers spoke in glowing terms of the spellbinding cinematography and the meticulous, precise staging, it was seemingly considered narratively weaker than his two aforementioned prior films. It was the first of Tar's works to premiere in competition at the Cannes Film Festival, but it won no prize. I have a number of critical reviews I could pot potentially feasibly quote, but they all surmise the same apparent issues of the film. Brilliant formal construction, somewhat meagre subtext. I suppose the, the prison of human guilt has been overfished as a thematic genus in the history of art and expression. That, that may be fair to, fair to express, fair to say. Though I noted a more insightful analysis, or haul, <laughs> of the film's themes, courtesy of one Martha Nochimson. No no Chimson, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. She, she wrote this in the New York Times uh, um, in 2007. There's a piece where, where she describes the philosophical takeaway of several films she saw at the, I believe, the New York Film Festival. And one of the films listed here is Bailatar's The Man from London. So according to Martha, the film is an exploration of anonymous breakdowns of social order in personal life. That's a quote-unquote... Generally, quote, questions of justice operate in the background, which foregrounds the perceptions and point of view of an accidental witness who, like the viewer, has no connection with anyone involved, unquote. They consider the film suggests the possibility that, quote, it is only on an abstract plane that murder committed by and on strangers causes a stir and demands an investigation. In this context, it is fitting that the investigation must be undertaken by a stranger. Excuse me. The man from London, since abstraction entails distancing from an enveloping context. Only the appearance of the man from London, Brown, impels Malloy to struggle with his de facto alienation, as an ordinary man, for moral principle, an alienation linked counterintuitively counter to the absence of desire in his daily grind. I like this piece. It identifies, more so than the issue of human guilt, a chain of shame. It, it identifies a coldness, a murder investigated as a formality, which impacts the emotional existence of those adjacent due to the formal consequences, more so than the immediate social consequences. Unknown strangers were murdered, were stolen from. The disorder of Malloy's microworld descends from a higher categorization of human events. It is not revenge that pursues him, not the vengeance of related criminals, but an investigator from far away, whose motivation is cold, flat, mildly non-existent. This man from London has a job to correct irregularities that only an impartial state can care about and deliver the consequences for. The implications of this, existentially, of a godlike state, the necessity of meta-societal authoritative abstracts to protect the blind spots of interpersonal communities, these are the film's more interesting thematic spaces in my opinion, as opposed to simply that of subdued, somber, paranoid shame. I would like to add my own personal takeaway of interest. The two characters of Brown and his apparently unnamed to my understanding, wife are the most symbolically fascinating to the film's subtext. Brown is an external manifestation, a kind of other, manifesting how our, how our subject, Malloyne, suspects he is being perceived externally. It is perhaps implied that Brown had some sort of connection with the murder, and may be aware of Malloyne's secret prize. Brown's wife, then, has the most fascinating face in the film, save for maybe Malloyne's daughter Henriette. She is investigated by the man from London, interviewed and interrogated, and chooses to remain silent. 
We will never know what she knows, but her surface skills, possibly by association, so juicy, so palpable, and it is, it is never overtly expressed. Her silence is paramount to the vicious cycle on display. Her shame is not the shame of a criminal, but of one who is cold, indifferent to her husband's own criminality, toward men she considers to be strangers. Upon consequences arriving to her husband, however, she exhales and finds room to grieve. The Man from London I find to be a, a strong piece of Bailatar's catalogue. I, I don't have I don't know what else to say about this. It's it's a I find it to be one of his strong strong works and um I mean I've enjoyed everything I've seen from Bailatar, with the exception of one film which I once viewed with my associate Gulen Dode. I'm not precisely sure which one it was. I am under the impression though it was 1984's Almanac of Four, which I hate to say it. I just found it, frankly, just a completely uninteresting film. Mind you, mind you, the copy that we saw was a TV or VHS rip, which was, which was, which was quite subpar. And um, yeah, it, it, neither of us cared for the film. Though I am a wholehearted fan of Damnation, Satan Tango, Werkmeister Harmonies, The Man from London, and The Turin Horse, as well as of 1982's Macbeth, which is, I believe, less less a scene tar, but a really terrific film, I think. And um, his, his three previous features, I believe, Family Nest, The Outsider, and The Prefab People, I have not seen these. I'll have to get on, onto those at some point in my, in my life before, or before I die. Anyway, that's Bailatar for you. And I, well... It, it, Bailatar is hard to recommend because even you, you, I could waffle on all day about how much I like these films, but, you know, like with Angela Poulos, like... Uh, Ming Liang Sai, it's only so challenging to recommend these films to casual film fans. Uh, even more more dedicated film fans, some of them see a certain indulgence in, in these sort of pictures. And, well, look, to each their own, I suppose, but I don't know. I think this is a very valid, very interesting and kind of obvious way to take existential cinema. I mean, why not? We have we have the capacity for these takes. We have the capacity for these extensive, woesome close-ups. I, I say there must be some sort of space where we can indulge in it. And that space may be dominated by one Bela Tarr. Hmm. This, this last uh, <laughs> minute or so was actually unscripted. I, I, I wrote about three pages of this and then and, and I chose to record without realizing I had no concluding paragraph, but there it is, improvised. Anyway, have a fantastic morning, everyone. Well, it's morning for me, and here I am talking about Bellatar. <laughs> this is my fantastic life. I do love it so. This is not the kind of thing you'd expect a Bellatar fan to say, but, well, here I am. Thank you, and have a good one.